Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The Word of God is most clear. The Scripture tells us, do not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. That means that God's will is this, that we are not on some spiritual island left to ourselves alone, but fellowship is very important. And we should meet frequently together, whether that's in a home or in a congregation or some other building, it's important for believers to assemble frequently together for worship, for fellowship, in order to see how to serve one another and to have a testimony outside the family of God, and of course, in order to study the Word of God. And when we study the Word of God, especially the teachings of Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth, we learn something. He placed an emphasis upon the kingdom. And as I've said many times to you, if you do not have that same emphasis on the kingdom of God, you are not going to be living a life pleasing to Him. You're not going to be living in a way that you will have a proper perspective for seeing this world, seeing it from how God sees it. A kingdom-minded individual has a very, very different point of view, a godly perspective. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 13. The book of Matthew and chapter 13. Now, find that 24th verse because here we're going to see that Yeshua is teaching us once more in a parable concerning the kingdom of God. Look at verse 24. Another parable he set before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man sowing good seed. And as frequently I do, I pause about that word good. I've shared with you many, many times. When that word good, whether it's in the Old Covenant or New Covenant, when that word good appears, what should enter into our mind? The concept of the will of God. Therefore, he was sowing seed, and that seed manifests the will of God in a given situation. And therefore, when that seed is planted in our heart, or we, as we'll find out later on in the book of Matthew, the same 13th chapter, we are the good seed. And therefore, we need to be producing the fruit is our actions, which are in light with God's will. Don't be deceived. Don't follow what is popular, and that's this, that my destiny, and usually when people hear that, they're deceived. Because what they want in the flesh, they are convinced that is God's will. It is not. They have some dream for their life, and they think that dream is a God-given dream. It's probably not. No, we find God's purpose, the plan for our life, usually in obedience to His Word. When we follow his instructions and we're growing and maturing in the faith after a significant period of time, that's when God begins to make known to us what his will for our lives truly is. And therefore, if it's something that, oh, I've always wanted this, as long as I can remember, I felt this was my destiny and now I've turned to God and he's going to make it happen. 
you have been deceived. This is not what the Word of God reveals. Now, it's not popular for me to say that, but that's okay. God never says, I do not know the biblical commandment that says, be ye popular. It's not there. Be faithful. Be obedient. Be committed to truth. And that's what we strive to be. So he says here, another parable I set before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sows good seeds in his field. And as the men slept, the enemy, specifically his enemy, came and sowed weeds in the midst of the wheat. Now, pay very close attention to what is said here. We find something. We find as these individuals, they were faithful, they did good works. They took that seed, they planted it, it was good seed. They planted it in this man's field. And here's the problem. As they rested, nighttime, under the cloak of darkness, who came? His enemy. Now, this is not a unique situation. This is what happens. When we are at rest, that's when the enemy comes at darkness. When we're not watching, when we're not uh, showing some diligence, we are resting. The enemy takes advantage of that. Nothing wrong with resting, nothing wrong with sleeping. But the enemy will exploit everything that he can to accomplish his purposes. Now, now the enemy is going to be condemned. But one thing that we can learn from him is that he is perseverant. He is committed. The problem is he's committed to the wrong things. So look carefully at this scripture. He says, as the men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds in the midst of the wheat. And then he departed, kind of like a hit and run situation. That's how the enemy functions. He comes in the darkness. He comes unannounced. He comes when no one's looking, no one is expecting. He does his damage. We oftentimes don't see his damage immediately. It's later on, down the, the road, in a week, in a month, in a year, many years. He's planted that, that bad seed, those weeds. And then in the future, they begin to manifest themselves. He departs. Look now to verse 26. And when the grass sprung up, also it made fruit. So the good seed is, is functioning, behaving, just as we would expect. It was planted in a good place in this man's field. The field was prepared. It was ready. The seed was sown and it produced fruit. All of that is well and fine, but learn something. It sprung up, this, this good seed, and made grass. But look at the end of verse, verse 20, 26, where it says, And then manifested also was the weeds. Now, what do we know? He's teaching us a principle. The principle's not hard to discern. It is our faithful work and the fruit that that faithful work produces that is going to bring satanic activity. Now, we're going to see something here. Twice, we're going to see, we've seen the first time, in a moment we'll see the second, that Yeshua in this parable is speaking about the enemy. Who is that enemy? Well, he's named him before, and he'll name him again later on. He's talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan. And learn a very important biblical truth, and that's this. There is an enemy. Remember what it says? His enemy. That means you and I have an enemy. And that enemy, first and foremost, is Satan, the diabolical one, the devil. And here's the problem. And I'm just going to be very honest. You need to hear this. 
If you are in a local fellowship, a assembly, a congregation, the local church, and the one who does the primary teaching, if he virtually never speaks, never mentions that there is a day of judgment, never mentions that there is an enemy called Satan, the devil, you need to get out of that congregation, leave that fellowship. Now, it may not be nice to say it, but it's for everyone's benefit. Why is that? Well, we need to be faithful to the Word of God. When we look at the Gospels, when we focus in on the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we see something. He spoke frequently, frequently about the enemy. He spoke a great deal about judgment, about hell, and about the devil, about Satan. He says that there was unclean spirits, demonic activity. So if you are in a local assembly and your leader never speaks about these things, this one is not teaching truth. And here's probably why he is not. And that is that he thinks those things are, they're immature. They're stories for children, a devil, a Satan, all of this. this we're, we're modern day we're not in some, some archaic culture 2,000 years ago. We're living today in modern times. Well, that's exactly what that enemy wants you to think. He works, what did we learn? When they slept under the cloak of darkness. Satan is overjoyed when people scoff at him, laugh at him. And make fun of this idea of this, this devil. You know, we kind of scoff at him with uh, pointed ears and horns and a tail and a pitchfork. Well, let me tell you. I don't know what he looks like, but there is an enemy called Hasatan, the devil. We need to realize that. And if we are not functioning with that truth in our minds, we are going to be defeated and defeated in a very shameful way. Notice what he says here. Verse, verse 27, he says, the servants, they came to the owner of the field and said to him, Master, this is the word, Lord, was it not good seed that you planted in your field? Therefore, how has it weeds? And what did he say? Verse 28. But he said to them, and I want to translate this very literally, ekthros anthropos. Now, these are two Greek words. Once more, ekthros is the word enemy. And the word anthropos is the word for man. Now, here's my contention. And that is today. Translators, Bible teachers, those who write commentaries about the scripture are way too casual. They are, are careless when it comes to the word of God. Now, when we study together, if we're studying the New Testament, you can see here I'm using the Greek New Testament. And here it has two words which mean an enemy, a man. And this is what I did. I looked at 28 different English translations. And of those 28, do you know how many actually has those two words, an enemy, a man, in, in their translation? Of the 28, only two. The other 26 just ignored that word. And when we ignore that word, we're missing out on a very important biblical, biblical teaching. And that's this. That enemy, that enemy frequently uses a human vessel, a man, a woman. We need to realize that. That there's an enemy and he's at work and more frequently than not, he uses 
a human instrument, an individual. Maybe someone that we, we like, someone that we're friends with, maybe someone we've never met before. He will use anyone in order to accomplish his purpose. So look again at this scripture, verse 28. But he said to them, an enemy, a man has done this. And his servants said to him, therefore, do you want that we should go away and gather them up? Now, what does he mean here, these, these servants? Very simply. They're saying, we'll get rid of the weeds. We'll pull them up. We'll gather them up from the field. We want to go to battle against the enemy. But we need to learn how to do it properly. Notice what the, the master says. He says to them, leave, leave them, and that they shall grow both of them together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to those who do the work of the harvest, the harvesters, gather up first the weeds and bind them into bundles and into the, the burning, for the burning of them. But the wheat gather into my barns. So we see a dichotomy, a separation. A separation that's going to happen when? At the harvest time, at the end, and we'll see this in a moment, at the end of this age. Now, he's not speaking here. We don't learn from this anything about our blessed hope, the rapture. He's speaking, and parables tend to speak about some general principles. And what he's speaking about here is not a teaching on the rapture, when is it going to happen, what's the order for it, and all of that. That's not the purpose of this passage. The purpose of this passage is set in verse 24, when he says, another parable he sets before them, the kingdom of heaven is likened. He's teaching about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And there's a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and this world. And what is that? In this world, there's the enemy. In this world, the enemy is going to function. And there is going to be those destructive influences around us until the very end, until the time of the harvest. Now, he's teaching us from the perspective of the kingdom and making a distinction between the kingdom and this world. So in this world, when we are, are acting in the will of God, it is going to bring about satanic activity. The enemy is going to come against us. We can expect that. We should know that. And we cannot just snap our fingers, do something, and the enemy will no longer be in this world. It's not going to happen. Satan is not bound now. He will be bound in the millennial kingdom. Until this time, what do we do? We go about serving, working, laboring, producing fruit. But realize something. He tells us at the end of the age, there's going to be that harvest. At the time of the harvest, the harvesters, and we'll learn more about this later on in this chapter, the harvesters are going to go out and first they're going to gather up the weeds. They are going to bind them into bundles and they are going to be, notice what it says, they are going to be burned. Then the wheat will be gathered into what? My barns. Verse 31. And another parable he set before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like like a mustard seed, which a man takes and plants in his field. Now, he's teaching us something about the kingdom of God, the labors of the kingdom of God, that seed for the laborers, his word, his will. It says here that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man takes and sows in his field. Look now to verse 32 which is the smallest of all the seeds 
but whenever it is grown, it becomes greater than all the other plants. It's greater than the plants or the greatest of the plants, even to the extent that it says, and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the heaven can come and they can dwell in its branches. So we see something. We see that although the kingdom of heaven may appear to our eyes right now, something that is rather small. Maybe of all the kingdoms of the world right now, those who belong to the kingdom of God, we're the smallest, but that's now in this, this age. But there's coming a change. When that mustard seed is grown, and you know what's interesting? That phrase for is grown is in the passive. It means that, that something has to act to cause it to be grown, to reach its full maturity. And when it does, it becomes not like any of the rest. The rest are plants. But in the garden, very important, garden, what comes into your mind? The purpose of God, his creation, like the Garden of Eden. But in the garden, it becomes the only tree to the extent that the birds of the heaven, they can come and dwell. It becomes a place of habitation. And that's what we need to realize, that our labor is going to become a blessing. It is going to, our labor produce in the end the kingdom of God. It is going to bring it about. Now, obviously, it's Messiah that establishes the kingdom, not us. But our labor is going to have a role in those blessing, those fulfillment of prophecy, that those promises that God's going to do because of our obedience. It is going to be a blessing to others. Look now to one more passage. Look now to verse 33 another parable and the first two that we we encountered says he sets before them but this one's different it says here another parable verse 33 he was speaking to them not that he set that before them but he was speaking to them and he says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast or leaven which a woman takes and hides in three measures of a flower now Numbers are important. Three is for the purpose of revealing something. Three manifests something. And we're going to see here that, that this yeast, now in this context, yeast does something. It brings about a change. While it is working, there's no initial effect. We don't see. In fact, when we look, and here's the problem, there are people who, when they hear Messiah is coming, he's coming, he's going to return. I'm talking about his second coming, putting the whole question of the rapture aside. I believe in that, but this is not what we're talking about. We're speaking about the establishment of the kingdom when my Messiah returns the second time at the end of this age. Not, not for the church, not to take us out of this world before his wrath falls. We're talking about the second coming for the establishment of the kingdom. And what we know here is that many people are going to mock that whole idea. The scripture speaks of that. There will be scoffers and mockers saying the world is in the same condition today as it was 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Generations come and go, but, but everything more or less is the same thing. False. You put yeast into flour. You don't initially see that the yeast is working, but it will, and it will bring about a change. That's what he's saying here in this passage. Once more, look at verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a yeast that a woman takes, she hides in three measures of flour until all of it, until all of it is what? Leaven. It is going to happen, function, there's going to be activity, 
But it's not until it goes through all, all of the flower, all of the world, then and only then will we see the change. So let me be very clear about this. You may be looking at this world and not seeing evidence that the coming of Messiah is, is approaching. We are living in a prophetic time. Things are happening. Now, we don't see the effects of the kingdom, but we see events that tell us, tell one who is prophetically literate, that the kingdom is near. And there's many things that we should be looking at and having discernment of, one of which is persecution of believers. It is growing today. Also, anti-Semitism is growing today. And we see another important indicator that the times, the end times are approaching. And what is that? There is more and more of a tendency to call that which is good, meaning that which is pleasing and, and in line with the will of God, the purposes of God, to call that evil. And to call that which is evil, to call it good. See, we need to wake up. If you are, are hearing my voice, watching this teaching, be assured of something. It's not an accident. God is calling you. God is speaking to you through his word, not through the foolishness of, of my words, but through the anointed, inerrant word of God. And as we've read some scripture today, allow that scripture to enter into your life and for it to work just like this, this yeast works through all of it, through the whole batch of flour, allow it to permeate every aspect of your life. That you become an individual that the word of God, the spirit of God, the truth of God, the power of God, the provision of God is, is taking hold of you. Every aspect of your being, that you become a new person, a kingdom-minded person who walks not in the futility of your own thoughts and your own desires, but that you take hold of the truth of God, that you are committed to the will of God, and that you're doing the purposes of God. And I'll tell you something, if you do that, you are going to sense his joy in your life, and you'll love it. Well, I'm out of time until next week, and we press on. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.